والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Indeed our praises belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the creator, the sustainer and controller of all that happens in the universe and we invoke his peace and blessings upon his noble messenger his family, his companions and all those who follow them in righteousness until the end of time my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. I just uh, noticed a note here about the mother of a sister, Jannah, who passed away in Kazakhstan and were asked to make dua for her. So I know many people have left, but nevertheless, please join me as we make a dua for our dear sister who passed away, as well as uh, all other brothers and sisters who have passed away. اللهم اغفر لأختنا هذه وجميع موتى المسلمين يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم اغفر لهم وارحمهم وعافهم وعف عنهم وأكرم نزولهم ووسع مدخلهم واغسلهم بالماء والثلج والبرد ونقهم من الذنوب والخطايا كما ينقى الثوب الأبيض من الدنس وأبدلهم دورا خيرا من دورهم وأزواجا خيرا من أزواجهم وأفسح لهم في قبورهم ونور لهم فيها اللهم جازهم بالإحسان إحسانا وبالسيئات عفوا وغفرانا اللهم أجرهم من فتنة القبر وعذاب النار وأدخلهم الجنة مع الأبرار برحمتك يا عزيز يا غفار يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم ارحمنا إذا سرنا إلى ما قد صاروا إليه اللهم ارحمنا إذا سرنا إلى ما قد صاروا إليه ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين uh, Brothers and sisters Society is at peace and people get along harmoniously of course when members of that society, the individual members of the society are willing to respect each other and to know about each other and to know about or learn about the various uh, practices, if you like, of each other. Tolerating the likes and dislikes of others. Even if we're Muslims only, we still would have different personal likes and dislikes. So what is key in a peaceful and harmonious society is not simply the legislative laws that force people to abide by these limits. Laws are important, of course, to regulate life. Without laws, without restrictions, without limits, life would get very chaotic. Life would get very chaotic. And this is, this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered us to always do things with balance. When Allah says in Surah Al-Rahman, وَالسَّمَاءَ رَفَعَهَا وَوَضَعَ الْمِيزَانِ and the heavens or the skies he raised high and he placed a balance Mizan here means a balance so there is a balance in this world not just in the life of the individual but there is a balance between the human and the non-human and then there is a balance between the planets themselves and the, and the heavenly bodies so Allah he said he raised the heavens and he plays the balance. The heavens, the, the universe was not just created like that. It is placed also in perfect balance. That's why Allah says that it is not fitting for the sun to overtake the moon or the moon to overtake the sun. It is not fitting, it is not for any creation to transgress that limit. Why? Because all these things operate based on this balance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed. So, laws are important, limits are important, 
to ensure that life does not become chaotic. And that's why we live in a society in which there are laws and there are rules. There are freedoms, of course, but there are rules as well. The idea is not to let one infringe on the other. So the idea or the balance is to ensure that rules and laws do not infringe on the freedoms. And at the same time, balance is also to ensure that your freedoms do not infringe on the laws. So there has to be a balance to, that, that has to be maintained for society to really achieve peace. And the Muslim community is no different from this, brothers and sisters. In many a hadith, the Prophet والسلام, has hammered home the idea and the concept that the essence of a Muslim individual is not only in the ritual worship that the person performs. This is definitely important. But part of that essence, to complete the essence of the Muslim individual as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants it, is that the individual should upkeep the, 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 the rituals, but at the same time, that individual is supposed to also have good character, good behavior. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ in many hadith, he has made good behavior so important, he has highlighted it to the point where he has made it part of what Islam is. And so today I would like to share with you one such hadith, brothers and sisters, that Shaykh Al-Albani graded as Sahih. It's a beautiful hadith because it makes us realize that it's not just laws alone, external laws that forces us to live by certain limits and this is what results in peace. This will certainly happen on the surface, but to have true peace and harmony, what you need is the individuals in the society, in the community, you need them to actually subscribe to this idea. Because you can have laws or limits that forces a person to abide by certain within certain boundaries or limits. The person may not, in, in their heart though, a, a, accept that. They might be submitting to the laws or the limits unwillingly. But what Islam wants us to achieve is willing participation. Willing participation. Because this is what brings about, truly brings about peace. When the peace is only surface, at the surface what happens, it, it doesn't take much to stir up trouble. And it happens all the time. When the peace is deep down, it takes a lot more than a comment here and a comment there to really blow everything apart. So the Prophet والسلام, of course under the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about not just setting up limits so that there is peace in society. He went about nurturing and molding the character of the people, the individuals in the society. Getting them to embrace the concept of peace. So that there will truly be peace and harmony in society. But peace and harmony can only come about, brothers and sisters, if there is mutual respect. There is mutual respect for each other. But the Prophet والسلام, took this to another level. In this hadith, he said, والسلام, لَيْسَ مِنَّا مَنْ لَمْ يُجِلَّ He is not from amongst us. لَيْسَ minna. He is not one of us. One of the Muslim Ummah. person may call themselves a Muslim, may claim to belong to the Muslim Ummah. But our claims... are not valid proof of our inner faith. It is our inner faith, what the heart feels, which usually, usually is manifested in our actions. This is really what matters. This is the proof of the claims we make with our mouths. So the Prophet والسلام, said, Laysa minna. He is not from amongst us. Man lam yujilla kabiran. 
who does not respect our 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 own elders. And the word yujil or ijlal, ijlalu shay does not mean respect it alone. It means to hold it in high esteem. Allah. Respect is the bare minimum. High esteem or ijlal is, is, is a level higher than that. We live in a society today and we live in a day and age, brothers and sisters, not just in our society, Allah. but across the world, you find that young people tend not to have that level of respect and, and esteem, high estimation for their elders that earlier generations used to have. These days, young people, and I'm not against young people, by the way, it's just that sometimes they take their, their assertiveness, which is a good thing, beyond certain limits to the point where they may not be disrespectful to older people, to the elders. But the Prophet ﷺ did not just say, show them respect. He says, man lam kabiran. You must hold them in high esteem. Let me give you an example, brothers and sisters, of how the Sahaba and even the Tabi'een, how they used to hold their elders in high esteem. If two companions were together, and they, had, they were asked a question, the younger one will hesitate to speak. He will let the older one speak first. Ali Imam Bukhari tells us in his Sahih, there is a hadith, in which the Prophet ﷺ, the hadith is related by Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhum. He said that one day the Prophet ﷺ told a group of companions that he said there is a tree, a plant, a tree that is similar to the Muslim, in that everything from this tree is beneficial for people. Nothing of it goes waste, is, is useless, nothing is useless. Everything, its trunk, its fruits of course, even the leaves, everything is useful for people. And the Prophet ﷺ said, the Muslim is like this tree. In other words, the Muslim is a useful individual to the whole society. You never or the Muslim should not be a liability or should not cause harm, but should bring benefit to society. He asked the companions, what tree is this? He said, I knew the answer. But there were older companions than myself present. And I did not want to be the one to jump forward to answer. He's a younger person. So he delayed, he, he held back and gave the older companions the chance to answer, but none of them answered either. And the Prophet ﷺ told them that it is the nakhla, the date palm, uh, the date palm tree. This is, this is the tree that is similar to the Muslim, or the Muslim is like this tree, similar to this tree. It is beneficial for people. Now Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhum, afterwards he went to his father, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhum, and he narrated to him, what transpired. And Umar radiallahu anhu said to him, Son, my dear son, for you to have answered that question, that would have been the dearest thing to me than the whole world. For you to answer a question that the Prophet asked that no other person who were older than you could answer, this would have been the most beloved thing to me. It would make me the happiest man in the world. But the point is, the shahid in the hadith is that Abdullah ibn Umar did not rush to answer out of his respect and ijlal of the older companions. He stayed quiet to the point where he never offered any answer. He waited, waited, and then the Prophet ﷺ answered that he told them the answer, that it is the nakhla. So ijlal al-kabir is not just respect, it is holding them in high esteem to the point where you don't push yourself forward in their presence. Or you ask their, their permission as we say. So one thing is, لَيْسَ مِنَّا مَنْ لَمْ, من لم يُجِلَّ كَبِيرَنَا He is not from us who does not hold in high esteem our elders. وَيَرْحَمْ صَغِيرَنَا 
is when, when the young person hears the first part, they think, hey, we have no place in society. No, you have a place. The Prophet ﷺ said, nor the one who does not show mercy and compassion for our young. Show mercy and compassion, tolerate them. They will make mistakes because they don't have the experience that the elders have. So they, the young ones, are supposed to hold the elders in high esteem. And the elders are supposed to be forbearing, compassionate, tolerant, easygoing, if you like, with the young ones. And not to be overly strict with them. Because they're growing now. And many things they will only learn through experience, through trial and error. That's what it is. See, this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives. Because many things we learn not from studying in, in books, but by actually trial and error, by doing things, by living life. And so the young people, they need our compassion. They need us to be patient with them. And not to expect that they're perfect like, like the elders. Because they don't have the experience yet and the wisdom. As they get older, they will, get, they will gain that as well. You know, I remember brothers and sisters, when I was younger, you know, we would do work with my dad. He's a carpenter by trade. Of course, now he's retired. But very often, when we do work, you know, building cupboards and building this and doing that, he, would, he will point out certain things to us and then he will say to us, he said, you will never learn this in the books. You can go to school as much as you want. There are certain things you cannot learn in the books. Only through experience you will get these things. And experience is based a lot on trial and error. So to balance things out, the elders are also supposed to be patient and compassionate and tolerant towards the young people. And you notice this is the balance. SubhanAllah. The Prophet ﷺ did not say you have to hold in high esteem the elders and that's it. He balanced that out with the elders being patient and compassionate and having rahmah for the young. So even if a young person does something that an older person may feel that this is disrespectful, even, even if a person has done that, then the elder should be patient and nicely, very nicely, talk with the young person and enlighten them and educate them. This is how things used to happen. But now we live in a time where the young seems to have, they seem to have lost this understanding of ijlal, of holding in high esteem, of valuing the elders. See, respect is one thing, but valuing them is what you need. At the same time, we also seem to have this reaction of the elders where because the young person may not hold them in high value, they are not patient and tolerant with the young people, but we need that balance. And then the third thing the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, وَلَمْ يَعْرِفْ لِعَالِمِنَا حَقَّهُ He is not from us, who does not hold in high esteem, our, our elders, who does not show compassion and, and patience, patience with our young, and does not recognize for our scholars their status or their rights. وَيَعْرِفْ وَلَمْ يَعْرِفْ لِعَالِمِنَا حَقَّهُ those who do not recognize or know for our scholars, their rights and their status. Last week, a brother uh, had a chat with me. And he was asking me about an issue. He said that there, there are groups, there are young, a lot of young people who, mashallah, they're very enthusiastic about learning and about practicing Islam. But what is happening is, a lot of these young people are becoming attached to certain shuyukh. And so, they tend only to accept things from their shuyukh. And not from any other shaykh. And sometimes they go to the point where they even do takfir. And in fact, sometimes even scholars themselves are guilty of this. Of not recognizing the status of another scholar. So very often they do takfir to the point or, or, or tafsir where they label certain scholars as fasiq and their students follow them. This is very dangerous. Very, very dangerous. 
And we should never go there, you know, labeling people. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, if you call a brother of yours any, if you give him any label, and that is not true, that label comes back to yourself. So you call someone a kafir and that's not true, it is the, the one who said that person is a kafir in the first place, that label comes, comes back to that person. This is serious. You call someone a munafiq and that is not true, then that label comes back to yourself. And this is why the scholars in the past, they never ever overstepped that limit. They were not afraid to say, look, you know, you're wrong. Your opinion, this opinion that you hold, it's wrong. Look at the delay. You see this all the time. If you look, read the books of Al-Hafid uh, al-Muhajar, al Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, Al-Imam Nawawi, very often, they, they mention the various views in their writings, and they tell you, look, this view is wrong, this color is wrong. But there was no malice, no hatred in saying, look, on this opinion, this person is wrong. They did not take away from the status of this person as a scholar. Because one mistake does not mean you're not a scholar. In fact, even the scholars will make many mistakes. Even the scholar will make many mistakes, not just one or two. This is why it is one time a man came to meet with Ali Malik rahimahullah. And he had heard all these great things about this Imam. You know, this man is a very knowledgeable Imam, great scholar. And he came and he asked him a list of questions. And to, to, to some of the questions, Ali Imam Malik said to him, I don't know the answer. Imam Malik says, I don't know. And so at the end, the man said to Imam Malik, you know, I'm disappointed in you. I had heard so many great things about you. But you telling me some of these questions, you don't know the answer to? And then Imam Malik said to him, listen, when you go back home to your people, you tell them, that Imam Malik said he does not know the answer to these questions. Go back and tell him that. So even the scholar, sometimes he doesn't know. Or he makes mistakes. That does not take away from his, his status as a scholar. So there is no need to start speaking about this person and bring down his status. What the scholars used to do in the past is they pointed out the mistake and they left it as that. So we need brothers and sisters to start letting our character reflect these values and principles that the Prophet taught us. They were not just rules. Well, if you don't respect the old, we'll throw you in jail. No. He made it part of religion, part of your deen. He's not from us. He's not Muslim. The one who does not have the, hold the, the elders in high esteem nor the elders who don't have compassion and patience with the young, nor those who don't recognize the status and uphold the status of our scholars. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us. May He cause us to be among those who value and hold in high esteem our elders. May He cause us to be among those who treat our young and our children and our youth with compassion, with patience and tolerance. And may He cause us to be among those who recognize the value and the status of our scholars and our learned people. May he open up our hearts and minds also so that we can understand this beautiful message he has revealed. And may he inspire and motivate all of us to live by it. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.